Jenny, las instrucciones, por favor. Sí, buenas tardes. Vamos a dar inicio al webinar el día de hoy. Bienvenidos y gracias a todos por su puntualidad. Eh, el webinar de hoy sobre medición precisa de la presión arterial, implicaciones y acciones. Tendrá un grupo selecto de panelistas y estamos todos muy, muy entusiasmados de que nos puedan acompañar. Esta sesión cuenta con traducción simultánea en español, en portugués y en inglés. Por favor, deben seleccionar su idioma de preferencia en la barra del menú inferior que tiene la plataforma Zoom. Les pedimos a todos los participantes y a los panelistas mantener sus micrófonos cerrados durante la sesión y recordar que deben eh, activar eh, sus cámaras y su micrófono al momento de que tengan eh, su intervención. Dejar en el chat un saludo, nos indican de qué país nos están, eh, se están conectando, nos están escribiendo y también pueden escribir cuál es su cargo, si lo desean, en la institución donde laboran. Y si tienen alguna pregunta académica para los panelistas, por favor, utilizar eh, la cajita que está también en la parte inferior del menú de preguntas y respuestas Q&A. Eh, la sesión está siendo, está siendo grabada, así que si por alguna razón deben salir, pueden ver la grabación posteriormente directamente en la página web de Hearts. Recordar que todos los 500 participantes que estén en la sala de Zoom recibirán su certificado de participación eh, si nos acompañan, por supuesto, hasta el final de la sesión. Adelante, doctor Orduñez, y bienvenidos todos. Okay. Adelante. Gracias, Jenny y demás colegas. Eh, quiero asegurarme antes de comenzar. Bueno, todavía tenemos ahí la pantalla principal, Jenny. No se está escuchando el canal de inglés, por favor. Y para poder comenzar con toda la de la ley, tenemos que asegurarnos de que todos we están escuchando. Sure that everyone que, is que, listening to us in English. Now we have the interpretation into English. Yes. So now. I think all of you are also seeing me, that everyone is uh, listening in the different languages. And so now I am going to uh, start. Uh, Jenny, yes, we can hear you very well, Pedro. All right, dear colleagues, I don't know whether to say good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, because we have people from everywhere so we have people from all over. I, I, we have some surprises. People who are uh, early, others late in the day. Some are really early in the morning. So thank you all for being here with us. Today, we have another webinar of Hearts in the Americas, and we're going to talk about accurate blood pressure measurement, implications and actions. In the Hearts technical package, this is a recurrent topic. It is a problem which is far from being solved because accuracy in blood pressure measurement is a very important um, issue. Uh, Imagine that this is a, a hard thing to reach, that accuracy. And I would like to draw your attention to this. We will have a roster of panelists who are world-renowned, and we will have also panelists who will illustrate for us the problem that we have. So uh, we have a first segment where we're going to uh, have a special issue of the Journal of Human Hypertension, which is totally devoted to measurement of blood pressure and uh, talking about clinically validated measure measuring devices these should be devices that are clinically validated the, these are the key terms our panelists are first-rate researchers who are going to talk about this 
and uh, we are going to talk about what we are doing in hearts in the americas those countries that are implementing hearts and um, the americas and we have a new country saint vincent and the grenadines country number 23 that joins the community of countries in the americas that become a part of hearts in the americas initiative this is a great initiative uh, and uh, at the core is management of blood pressure we, in the second segment we have panelists or i'm sorry this first blocks will have our main speaker who will tell us what it is the road ahead we have and that will be in the third segment and professor sharman james sharman uh, he will be the key speaker for uh, the uh, third segment uh, he is in australia we have almost 400 people in the room now and we also have our youtube channel open so what I'm going to ask you is to greet us through the chat, but without any further ado. And repeating that this is a very important topic. Now I would want to leave you with Dr. Tammy M. Brady, Associate Professor, Professor of, of Pediatrics. And she is a medical director, hypertension program division of pediatric nephrology, Johns Hopkins University, Baltimore, USA. So without uh, further ado, Dr. Brady, please, uh, you are welcome over to you. Great, thank you so much. Um, let me, um, I, someone needs to let me share my screen. There we go. Um, and can I confirm that you can see my slide sharing the, um, can somebody give me indication? Yes. Okay, yes. perfect, great. Adelante, Tami, adelante, Tami. Yo, yo te, te puedo guiar. Everything is okay, Tami. Go ahead, great. please. Thank you so much. Um, so thank you so much for that introduction and for inviting me to speak here today. As mentioned, I'm Tammy Brady and I am a pediatric nephrologist at Johns Hopkins. Uh, my career focus really has been on cardiovascular health promotion across the lifespan. Um, and I'm particularly passionate about ensuring that blood pressure measurement is done accurately. And a part of that, uh, really making sure that blood pressure devices that are used have been clinically validated for accuracy before use. So in that vein, um, to give some full disclosure, I um, am currently serving as the co-chair for the Association for the Advancement of Medical Instrumentation, or AMI, SFIG Manometer Committee, um, which is tasked with developing validation protocols for manufacturers to use to test their devices for accuracy. Um, and I also serve as co-chair on the American Medical Association Validated Device Listing Independent Review Committee, um, and we are tasked with reviewing applications for manufacturers um, for placement of devices on our, our, our registry. Um, and we need to review those uh, applications to determine that the validation testing was done properly prior to listing them. Um, so I was particularly um, excited to be invited as a special editor for this spotlight issue in the Journal of Human Hypertension entitled Oscillometric Automated Blood Pressure Device Accuracy Global Call to Action. So to start, I wanted to just highlight why this call to action was needed. And we'll certainly hear some more about this from Dr. Sharman. Uh, but over the last few decades, and I'm particularly after 2005, when the global policy directive to phase out mercury uh, from healthcare settings due to the environmental toxicity was implemented, we saw a, a, a significant increase in blood pressure measure, automated blood pressure measurement devices being used in clinical settings. And over time, these automated devices have become preferred over manual blood pressure measurement for many reasons, um, but specifically because these devices have lower operator error. And while they do require some maintenance, they have significantly less maintenance requirements than aneroid devices. 
However, it might be surprising to hear that most of the automated blood pressure measuring devices have not undergone adequate validation testing to ensure clinical accuracy. So up to 80% of the devices that are available for sale have not been tested formally to determine if they are accurate. And these untested devices have greater measurement variability and are much more likely to be inaccurate. So before I go on, I wanna make sure that I am being clear in some of the, the definitions of some of the terms that I am using. So when I say clinical validation, I'm indicating a process by which devices are tested for accuracy in healthy people and in people with hypertension. And I re when I refer to a clinically validated blood pressure measurement device, I'm referring to one that has undergone rigorous standardized testing against the gold standard to make sure that the device produces accurate measurements. And that gold standard is a properly calibrated manual auscultatory measurement. So when obtaining a manual blood pressure measurement, the blood pressure cuff is inflated to a point at which the brachial artery is fully compressed. And then it's deflated uh, until you start to hear the onset, and I'm sorry, it's deflated and individuals will listen until they hear the onset of two consecutive taps or crock cough sounds. The first of those two taps are, is considered K1, and that's the systolic blood pressure measurement. And the point at which those uh, crock cough sounds stop um, is K5, and that is considered the diastolic blood pressure measurement. Now to contrast that to how blood pressure measurement is estimated with automated devices, you have a similar cuff inflation to the point at which the brachial artery is constricted. But at some point during either inflation or deflation, the cuff is designed to sense variations in volume, in um, vibration, um, and, and, and these sensations lead the device to develop a cuff pressure curve, which is then extracted to develop an oscillometric waveform and then that is constructed into an oscillometric waveform envelope. Now this envelope um, allows us to visualize and calculate the maximal amplitude, which is an estimate of the mean arterial pressure. And then using fixed ratio coefficients and algorithms, this, is, um, this envelope has allowed the device to develop or to provide the output of what the systolic and diastolic blood pressure is. Um, now, these fixed ratio coefficient can vary very much from device to device, but for example, typically um, the systolic blood pressure is determined based on a fixed ratio coefficient that's about 50th percentile of the maximal amplitude, and diastolic blood pressure is at about 70% of the maximal amplitude. So you can imagine that anywhere along that process, there's multiple areas or potential sources of error in terms of getting blood pressure measurement. Now, one of the differences that I didn't highlight on the earlier slide um, is in regards to the cuff. Blood pressure cuffs used with manual auscultation are required to conform to um, certain dimensions. So those cuffs need to have a blood, uh, the inflatable portion of that cuff needs to have a width that is at least 37 to 50% of the measured midarm circumference of the patient. And it needs to have a length that's 80 to 100% of the measured midarm circumference. Cuffs that are used with automated devices don't have any such requirements um, because manufacturers are allowed to innovate and develop cuffs that are appropriate for their, cuff, their device system. Now, in scenarios where there is a narrow cuff, that could require a higher pressure to induce that maximum pulsation, leading to an increase in broadened oscillometric waveform, which can have downstream effects when it comes to estimation. In addition, blood pressure devices often will have a fast deflation rate because end users prefer that. It gives you a quicker blood pressure measurement. But with that fast deflation rate, you can get fewer oscillometric waveforms. So the device then is required to interpolate more um, in order to get that envelope generation. So this can lead to greater error. In addition, the devices, when they extract the oscillometric waveform and construct the waveform envelope, they require filtering methods that can distort the shape of pulses and the waveform. Um, and there are multiple signaling uh, processing methods possible that can lead to variability in the envelope, all of which can impact the blood pressure estimations. And finally, there are many blood pressure algorithms that are available um, to determine these blood pressure estimations based on the above. These are proprietary, they have variable performance characteristics, they're empirical, so they don't account for physiologic variability, such as things like arterial stiffness. 
Um, and the optimal fixed ratio coefficients really depend on the method used to construct those waveform envelopes. So again, there are multiple opportunities for error along the way to developing a blood pressure estimation with these devices. And it's for this reason that validation testing for accuracy is so essential prior to using a device for clinical use. Uh, there are multiple protocols that are available for manufacturers to use to determine if their devices are accurate. The most recent of these is um, what we call the quote unquote universal standard. Um, this is the Amy ESH and ISO protocol that was most recently published in 2018 with an amendment that was published in 2020. So hopefully I could have convinced all of you how essential it is to determine if a device you were using for clinical use has actually been tested for accuracy, but we recognize that that's not always easy to determine, right? So you can have a device you want to use and it may not be easy to find out whether or not it has undergone that validation testing. And for this reason, there are multiple professional societies and um, individual organizations that have developed registries to list validated blood pressure measuring devices to make this uh, selection process easier. And you have listed some of these here on this slide. Despite this, there remain challenges to identifying validated blood pressure measuring devices in low and middle income countries. And part of this is due to differences between countries in what devices are available. So what is available in one country may not be available in another country. In addition, some devices have differences in labeling and branding depending on the region of the world that it's marketed. And so an absolutely identical device um, may have completely different packaging and labeling. And that's really the only thing that's different. The way they operate is completely the same. It just has different packaging. And so that can be make things confusing. Uh, and also there are differences between countries and the medical device regulations that also contribute. Those validated device listings that I mentioned on the earlier slide, I also wanna highlight are based in high income countries. So some of the, those current validated device lists may not provide coverage of all validated devices available in all world regions. Now, Hearts in the Americas is a wonderful um, global example of how to use these clinically validated automated devices for the prevention and management of cardiovascular disease. Um, and as a part of this comprehensive multinational risk reduction initiative, they've come up with recommendations for countries to use towards the exclusive use of clinically validated automated devices. And you can see their recommendations vary from early adoption strategies all the way through enforcement. In addition, um, several countries uh, who participate in the Hearts in the Americas initiative have also shared their experiences on the path to this exclusive use of validated automated blood pressure measuring devices. Um, and as you can see on this slide, they have various focuses from regulations to procurement, and each country shares their strengths and their challenges um, and also provide lessons for other countries as they also uh, journey on this path. There have been other um, efforts to determine the potential return on investment for countries who want to uh, invest in better device validation um, and better use of trained observers of blood pressure devices. And in this translational research project that was done um, with Australia as the test case, using well-documented assumptions and projections on costs and benefits, um, over an eight-year period of time, you can see that there is a beneficial return on investment starting at year five, and with a more than doubling of that at year eight. And importantly, um, these calculations do not also include the significant societal benefit to individuals who are avoiding unnecessary medications or perhaps downstream impacts of unmanaged hypertension. Finally, in this special issue, we also include the industry perspectives on the global use of validated BP measuring devices. And so many uh, leaders from manufacturers um, across the globe contributed to this paper. And these authors all support the exclusive use of this universal protocol for validation testing. They also support independently run validation testing, meaning having individuals who are not financially or otherwise connected to the manufacturer be the ones to actually do the validation testing to ensure the device is accurate. They also support publication of these study results in peer-reviewed journals, as well as continuing to list these devices on validated device registries that are backed by professional societies. 
The manufacturers also want to push the field forward and call for increasing public awareness uh, on this topic, as well as promotion of the use of validated BP measuring devices. Um, among other things, they request a non-mercury sphygmometer based reference device to assist. And they call for all manufacturers to include all of the cuffs that are provided with each device in their validation studies. Uh, and they also ask for increased testing in special patient populations, which include children and pregnant women, among others. So with that, I will end my introduction to this webinar. And I think we're moving on to what I consider the more interesting and exciting part, which is where we get to have a panel discussion with real leaders in the field of blood pressure devices and validation testing. Uh, so with this, I will hand over the reins to Dr. Ordonez again and invite Dr. Sergio, Shoot, and Ringrose to help us understand more um, the issues at hand. So thank you very much for your attention. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Brady. I hope that people are uh, a lot more intrigued now the and now I am going to well we have almost 500 people who have joined us the question that I have now is Tammy is the following if you're a doctor you're there in your office in your healthcare center my your question is oh well is the uh, blood pressure device that I am using is it clinically validated is it accurate is the way I am testing my patients the best uh, way? And this is exactly what will happen now in our discussion. So I invite the panelists for the first segment. And I would like to introduce uh, Dr. George S. Sturgeo, Dr. Alta Schutte, and Dr. Jennifer Ringrose. Uh, so please, I invite you to turn on your cameras uh, so that we can have our panel. Many of you are very far away and it's early in your countries. We have almost 500 people uh, in the webinar. We have people from different countries. We have people from Ecuador, Brazil, Chile, Panama, Argentina, Dominican Republic, Costa Rica, Peru, Mexico, Colombia, Bolivia. Barbados, uh, Montserrat, St. Vincent and the Grenadines, uh, which I already said is the latest country to join heart, uh, Virgin Islands, British Virgin Islands, uh, Uruguay, and we have countries that are not yet in heart Uruguay, but I would like to welcome colleagues from Uruguay. They usually aren't here, Puerto Rico, Venezuela, and Spain. These are among the other countries that are with us. So we have uh, almost 500 participants. So now over to the uh, panelists. So first of all, Dr. George Sturgeo, he is a professor of medicine and hypertension from the Hypertension Center, Stride 7, Third University Department of Medicine, Sotria Hospital in Athens, Greece. And so, wow, we are doing a geography course as well. We have participants from different places. Dr. Alta Schutte is our other panelist, um, Professor, School of Population Health, University of New South Wales, Sydney, Australia. She's well known um, by those who follow this topic. Dr. Alta Schutte was president of the Hypertension Association, and we are very happy to see you here for the first time in a hearts webinar and then dr jennifer Ringrose, who, who is an associate professor of medicine general internal medicine residency program director university of alberta edmonton canada jennifer is um one of our heart consultants uh, well uh, so i'm going to give the floor to the panelists. And so please, if our uh, panelists um, could turn on their cameras and also Tammy, turn on your camera as well so that you are also here with the panelists. So my first question is for Dr. Sturgeo. 
welcome again, welcome to our hearts in the Americas. Uh, based on what Tammy has talked about and the challenge really to all of us, this is my question. In your experience, which is the most common uh, mistake or error with the validation the clinical validation tests of uh, blood pressure measuring devices. Over to you, Professor Sturgeon. So thank you for inviting me to this uh, very challenging discussion. Um, I have to say that uh, here in Athens it's midnight, but uh, we used to stay <laughs> late, uh, uh, here in Athens because it's summer. So first, I'd like to say that Stride B looks at the published studies, published studies in PubMed journals. So we look at the good studies. There's a lot of studies which have uh, not been published or have failed. So in the good studies, one of the main problem is how the reference blood pressure measurement has been performed. What was the sequence in reference and test measurements, whether there were two observers, the what was the reference device and whether the proper the appropriate cuffs have been used so take having the optimal reference method is an, a common problem another issue we face with published studies is the incomplete reporting of key information which makes these uh, studies questionable I think uh, it's, it's, a, it's an intellectual exercise to look at the problems of the studies. What is important is that many of these violations are unintended and are due to the fact that the protocols we use are quite often complex. And we have tried to put some clear instructions to guide researchers um, on following the validation uh, protocols properly. So it's, this is very important how to help many researchers do the studies in the way that the protocols require. Muy bien, muchísimas gracias. Eso es parte del problema. Estoy seguro que vamos a volver a regresar con el profesor Estrecho, pero ahora... Very well, thank you very much. I'm sure that we are going to go back to the doctor, but now I have a question for Alta. Now that we have this problem that everything is sold online and there is an incredible proliferation of um, uh, the cuffs, and how do we afford how do we address the issue of selling blood pressure monitors online because you cannot know whether this is uh, approved or not please dr alta go ahead uh, thank you pedro and also to the organizers it's, I'm, I'm delighted to be joining you today and uh, congratulations on co attracting such a large audience across the americas it's a fantastic initiative so yes, I, I, I fully agree. There's a massive challenge. People can buy devices through websites like Amazon and, and, and other sources. But I think the issue should be addressed from two sides. I think there should be increased awareness. Uh, even doctors don't know that devices should be, should be validated for accuracy before they use them. Um, so how can we expect patients to buy these devices online for home blood pressure monitoring, for example, to know that the devices are validated? So we need a major mainstream um, advocacy and uh, advertising of this important aspect that patients, public, doctors, everybody know that, that devices should be validated for accuracy. And on, on the other hand, I think the major push should come from regulator to regulators to ensure that devices that are available are only the ones that have been validated for accuracy. So that is a major uh, change on how things are done because obviously currently the devices that are sold are not um, checked or those that go through regulations like the FDA, they don't check whether the devices were validated for accuracy, they just check them for safety. And in fact, if patients or doctors use devices that are not validated, it is a safety issue because they can either underdiagnose or overdiagnose and over treat patients. So um, I think that should be from both sides. Regulators should be informed and, and implementing this and also major awareness campaign for everyone. So this is a fantastic um, uh, way, segue into that. 
Much, muchísimas gracias por esta respuesta. Pero fíjate. thank you very much for this answer. But this is a, such a complex topic that goes beyond the consumers. This also has to do with the health centers. One would think that this does not happen at the level of the health centers. Of course it does. And that's why an earlier step has to do with regulations. I would like to ask Dr. Jennifer to share her opinion. Well, if you had to define an area of regulation where you would be able to improve the situation, what would be that area or what would be the areas that you think we need to focus more in our regulation? Please go ahead. Thank you. And thank you also for the invitation to be here. Such an important topic and, and so great that Hearts is um, making such a, a, a strive towards improving blood pressure measurement. Um, I, I agree with what we've heard earlier today that we need um, uh, to regulate um, the availability of only validated blood pressure devices. Um, as we heard, the um, safety of devices is, is regulated, but the clinical validation is, is not. And um, we've heard that there are registries that clinicians and consumers can consult to know which devices have been validated, but those have been available for years. And, and we've heard that uh, the majority of devices available are unvalidated. So I think that manufacturers need the impetus um, of regulations mandating clinical validation in order to justify the expense and complexity of a clinical validation study. Thank you very much, Dr. Jennifer. And it is a pleasure to meet you again here with Hart. Do you recall when you were helping us in Cuba, in Ecuador? So people were happy, very happy. And I am going to ask the panelists to look at the chat. The, at the chat, there are specific questions addressed to you. So you might want to answer the ones addressed to you. But going back to Professor Georgia, with all of his significant experience, if now in the Americas we're deciding that the next step is to make progress in the area of regulations so that the equipment used is, is the one that is validated, but the market does not always respond appropriately. So in your opinion, what is the greatest threat to be able to have the universal availability <laughs> of um, validated cuffs that are completely calibrated? Please go ahead. So thank you for this uh, question. Uh, a very simple solution to the problem uh, might be to say, we do not allow any device which is not uh, properly validated to be put on the market. Well, this cannot happen. And this cannot happen because we have too many devices and very few centers to, uh, to do the delicate uh, experiment, which is a validation study. So too many devices, and now we have opened the field of cuffless devices, too many of them requiring uh, complex validation. So the solution is that we need to have more centers to do proper validations. And in order to do that, we have to simplify, and I would say compromise the validation process. Several years ago, I think two decades ago, the European Society of Hypertension compromised the validation protocol, made a simple protocol, which was inferior to the protocol we wish to have, but this was successful in having too many devices uh, validated. So if we wish to have many devices validated, we have to struggle a little compromise to come out with something which is si simple, relative simple, and involve more centers in dealing with the many, many new devices appearing on the market.
Sí, definitivamente este es uno, uno de los Yes, indeed, this is one of the most significant issues. How do we help researchers and also the regulatory agencies within the countries? How can they strengthen themselves to be more active in regulation? I am now going to give the floor to Dr. Alta, knowing that it is a challenge and to publish a research is always a challenge and not everyone has the same training. So what are the ways we can suggest manufacturers or is it just that we're telling them only if they are not in the peer reviewed journals, we are not accept accepting them as such. What is your opinion regarding this? Yes, thank you, Pedro. I think um, it is at this stage uh, quite important that these um, validation studies get published. You, it needs to be peer reviewed and looked, looked at by others to know that it has been done accurately and correctly before we can accept this. So I agree with what George has said. So perhaps there should be a sort of a call for centers to become validation centers and have this specialized facilities that are independent from the manufacturers that can review devices properly and validate them according to this protocol because the protocol is clear and simple with steps but a newcomer may not necessarily follow this accurately so if there's more specialized centers around the world also in in low and middle income regions that would potentially be an ideal solution but it will take time to set this up on the other hand, we also have the problem where the journals, uh, where these validation studies are typically published, the reviewers don't know how to do the, the, the checking for validation uh, to, to, to ensure that it was done properly. So um, George mentioned that we are at Stride BP for the uh, checking the validation of devices and, and those papers. And we have a specific checklist that we use in-house um, to check this uh, quite easily and perhaps a good way forward would be to share with journal editors for the typical journals that do publish validation studies say please indicate to your reviewers that they should look at this checklist before approving a paper for publication so that may, may be one way to overcome this and, and to show that it is validated properly. Thank you very much. This is something really serious because we see what is happening in the Americas. In the Americas, the countries would like to make progress towards regulation. And for example, at the heart centers, we currently have 1,400 centers of primary health care that are implementing hearts. By, the, by late 2022, we are going to have about 4,000 centers. Each center has between has a reference population, 20,000 to 30,000 inhabitants, people that are under hearts and governments are focusing on this because when they are going out to the market, they cannot find the validated piece of equipment. It is not easy to find that the piece of equipment has been validated. And even when they find the validated piece, the, the amounts are not enough. So, and some markets are more difficult than others. And I am being told that from the point of view of a manufacturer, which one do you think could be the greatest barriers? I would also say when they mention the bar, the manufacturer, for example, we are going to include a barrier at the moment of validation. I would say that we can also help them follow the rules. So what are Jenny, the rules that the, the manufacturers can follow for the validation of the equipment. Jennifer? I think that the um, universal standard, the collaboration between AMI, ESH, and ISO is a, is a great step towards that for manufacturers. It, it simplifies the um, that there's one universal protocol that um, a manufacturer can um, read and execute in order to validate their their device. I think previously there was um, there were multiple protocols and and manufacturers would have to um, sometimes, do different protocols in order to have their devices validated in, in different countries where only some protocols were recognized. So that is a great um, move towards that um, with the universal standard. 
I think um, right now, from a manufacturing perspective, the the cost of a validation study would be, um, I suppose, a a barrier, and and the standard itself is as we've heard quite complex and and densely worded and and i think without um knowing the history of the intention of some of those um aspects of the of the protocol it it may be confusing for the ex proper execution of the of the protocol I think well, though, the Cuba example is a great example of um, the manufacturers and and um, the clinicians working together to get a locally made device um, uh, undergoing a validation study. Bueno, muchísimas gracias, Jennifer. Thank you, Jennifer. Now I am going to do the last round with the panel members for them to say some words to conclude. And we have many questions in the chat. As far as you can, please help our audience to continue connected. But some are saying, well, if the manufacturers would like to sell equipment, have them invest in validation. This is what I see in the chat. But I am going to give you the Flora, Tammy, why is it that this is this the number that we see in the hypertension journal is just, uh, why is it that we need to have that journal? Why is it that this is such an important journal? Well, I think that this issue in the Journal of Human Hypertension really raises awareness. And I think it's a nice compilation to really set the stage as to why this is such a big issue. And I hope that this will spur uh, yeah, manufacturers um, and, and those involved in healthcare to do better and to really pay more attention to this issue. Um, I think the more that I talk about this in public forums, the more I hear from others that they had no idea about the complexities by which devices don't measure, but estimate blood pressure and all the potential challenges to accuracy. And so I think that this is a great opportunity to raise awareness and to hopefully move the field forward in that regard. Muchísimas gracias, Dr. George. Thank you very much, Dr. George. Some final words to the to the public that has been listening to you so attentively. I think uh, we have to accept that we still have this classic measurement of this vital sign as the the only uh, way to identify who needs to be treated, how many drugs he should take, and so on. And we have to recognize that we still have problems in accurately taking these measurements. I think it's very important to raise discussion and awareness about these problems. And even uh, if doctors and patients try to find which devices are validated and accurate, this will put pressure in the industry to validate their devices. There are many manufacturers that are dedicated to validate all devices. But this is something that we have to put pressure on. We must push people, doctors, patients, and manufacturers to, uh, the, to validate all devices that they put on the market. Muy bien, entonces, muy very well. Thank you very much. Alta, what is the message? that you'd like to share with the hearts audience in the Americas. Thank you, Pedro. I, I think it's it's such an important measurement that's still the one that's made most in clinical practice all around the world, and I'm sure it's the same in the Americas. Uh, there cannot be enough emphasis on getting this right and, and sharing this message. Um, I think uh, it's good to move away from mercury devices, so that means there's less observer error, hopefully. Uh, by the people taking the blood pressure measurement. So we have to raise awareness and also use this platform to sh share with the audience these various registries that are available. So for people on the ground level, I think it's really important to, to make sure everyone knows how to check whether a blood pressure device is validated. And there are several available. Tammy nicely showed them earlier, but I 
I, I hope that this is also shared widely. It's not so difficult to check it now. Um, uh, and on the other hand, people work towards val validating them, but it's important to get the message out how and where to check because lots of people don't know that either. <laughs> Muy bien, muchísimas gracias. Very well. Thank you very much. Jennifer, what is your message to your friends, your friends from the region that you have helped move forward in the area of validation? I think um, it's a fantastic step forward that um, PAHO and HEARTS are, are supporting um, the awareness of, of knowing the importance of accuracy and how to accomplish uh, a validation study and how to scrutinize work that's been done in order to know whether a device is, is valid or, or not. So um, raising that awareness and, and supporting regulations, that is a, a, a great start. Bueno, muchísimas gracias a todos, a todos los panelistas por este extraordinario. I'd like to thank all of the panel members for the first round. I am going to give you a brief pause for you to exercise, stretch. This is going to be an active break. And now we have the course on automatic measuring and uh, automatic measuring of the of blood pressure. And we have dozens of thousands of individuals who have watched it. So please go ahead with a break. How to properly measure blood pressure. Five steps. Do you know what the number one single reversible risk for death is on our planet? It's increased blood pressure. Increased blood pressure is the number one single health risk that causes the greatest loss of life from conditions like heart disease and stroke. The good news is that increased blood pressure is reversible. Just imagine how many lives could be saved if people knew they had high blood pressure and received treatment to lower it. That's why properly measuring blood pressure is really important. We need to measure blood pressure properly so we can trust that the readings we get are accurate. I'd like to thank the production team for this uh, moment and just to remind you how important it is to measure blood pressure. And now we move on to the next segment without forgetting to tell you that we have a surprise towards the end of this session. And the surprise is that we will be announcing within the framework of the official announcement, we will be informing on the International League of Blood Pressure Monitoring and who the best are. So this will come after our academic presentation. Now we are going to listen to the second academic presentation, Hearts in the Americas, how to improve it. And now I am going to introduce you to Cynthia Lombardi, who is an international consultant with PAHO, working on the Hearts Initiative and also who has been a leader in the accurate reading of blood pressure and also the regulation to have automatic validated pieces of equipment. So, Cynthia, please go ahead. Cynthia? Buenos for some of you. Um, I'll talk about the two papers on the hearts and accuracy of uh, blood pressure uh, devices that were included in the special issue of the Journal of uh, Human Hypertension that were introduced by Dr. Um, Brady. Here you can uh, see the title of these uh, two papers. Uh, one has been published already, the one to the left, and uh, the other one was accepted for uh, publication and it's in press. I'll start with the one to the left, which describes the heart's um, approach on accuracy of uh, BP devices. 
So to put these papers into uh, context, uh, I want to point out that Hertz in the Americas work on DP measurement is conducted in two uh, broad areas which concern the requirements for accurate measurement. Uh, one um, of these areas is addressed by training education, the one on top, and then we have uh, the other one is uh, focused on the use of validated DP uh, devices, specifically on procurement and regulations. These two papers focus on the latter. Um, the goal of Hearts in the Americas is the exclusive use of validated BP devices in primary healthcare facilities. The pathway to reach the goal, uh, which was described in the paper, and as uh, you see here, is through the requirement of proof of accuracy validation in both the authorization for a device to be sold in the country was uh, mostly imported except for uh, Cuba, um, and the procurement of BP devices with public funds to use in uh, healthcare facilities. To the right, you can see um, a summary of this strategy and uh, that HEARTS is adopting, which evolved from the work we conduct with the countries and includes all these uh, steps uh, which fit into each other. So basically, Hertz promote these actions seen at the left, but provide technical support for uh, the implementation. So it's a mix of uh, promotion, advocacy, and uh, technical uh, support. So with, with regards to the implementation process on components of the regulations, uh, I'd like to note that uh, we can see the list here, but I will emphasize a few points. Voluntary measures rarely, uh, from our experience, rarely happen, uh, at least to the extent that they can have a significant impact in public health. Uh, therefore, government, governments must uh, act. To be sustainable, regulations have to be part of a wide effort to address non-communicable diseases and hypertension. Uh, regulations must be flexible to allow for incorporation of new validation standards. Uh, implementation needs to be gradual because there's a lot uh, uh, at stake, as we can see with the panelists. Uh, the market uh, is one example. The number of devices that uh, exist now that has not been validated. Enforcement must be a key component to ensure compliance. Uh, how do you got to that uh, strategy, in that pathway? Uh, as a background, I can refer to a mapping of uh, regulations that was conducted in 2020 um, by PAHO and that showed that not only there are no regulations of BP devices in countries implementing HERTS, but uh, with a few exceptions uh, of those regulations, they didn't include validation um, or were not enforced uh, in the case that they did include. Moreover, there was no uh, awareness of the importance of validation and very little data on uh, which devices were being used in, in primary healthcare uh, facilities. So we start our work with uh, data, this data. As our work evolved and a country started taking action and we kept uh, in uh, close contact uh, with them and had meetings, we learned about additional challenges. And some are already uh, mentioned for example, when governments want to buy BP devices, it's very hard to find ones that are validated uh, and that have different uh, cut size and or have alternative uh, power sources, for example, electric and non-batteries. There are claims of equivalence to models that are validated, but uh, we see not, no proof. Manufacturers do not present the proof and we cannot find them in the registers. It's also hard to find information, calibration frequency, or maximum number of measurements for um, the devices. Uh, on the other hand, when you try to find information about a marketing registration of device in, uh, in recent purchase by government, we cannot find this information online unless easily, or the information is uh, incomplete. Another issue is that there's still resistance to automated devices. 
So some governments are still purchasing uh, Android devices. Uh, even if you know all of the advantages of the automated ones. And there are more challenges um, that they're not going to mention here, but this um, points to the need of, uh, for a strong uh, regulatory uh, framework. So back to the work we do uh, at Bajo Regional Office uh, about providing technical support to governments. This is the cover of a PAHO publication that provided guidance on the development of regulations and can be used as a tool uh, by governments for procurement as well. It can be found in the Cards in the America website. The link has been sent to you on the chat. This, uh, the main recommendation is the use of the universal standard uh, for uh, clinical validation studies. Now, a piece of good news here is the translation of this publication to Spanish was just finalized, and we can say that today, that uh, it is uh, available in the Americas, Far Hearts of the Americas website. The link is here and it's also on uh, the chat. Now, other resources that PAHO provides uh, this work uh, are this that uh, shown here uh, in a succinct manner is information registered of validated. Uh, devices that are more likely to be found in the region. Um, and um, the technical specifications here to the right, it was developed, uh, adopted by, from WHO uh, document by our colleagues at PAHO. Uh, it can be used for both development, regulation, and procurement. Uh, we aim at uh, having a regional list or national lists of validated devices available uh, at some point, hopefully soon, even uh, if the uh, that will include uh, a few, uh, a reduced number of validated devices. Now I'll touch briefly on the paper that illustrates the effort uh, by countries. First, I'd like just to mention the overall progress that has been observed in the countries of better than regional level, or I already mentioned the China, you know. Um, clinical validation is now part of the conversation on hypertension control before there's no awareness, no uh, knowledge in what validation is. Now uh, we're talking about it. Um, in many countries, the procurement mechanisms have been modified in some in a normative way. Uh, governments are purchasing validated devices at national level or local level or in, uh, facilities implementing parts. And there's an ongoing process to include the devices in pool procurement through the PAHO strategic fund. Um, just to uh, finalize, um, in the paper, um, the progress of serving specific countries is illustrated by example of six countries, Brazil, Chile, Cuba, Dominican Republic, Ecuador, and San Lucia. And the approaches by the governments uh, are very different. And it's, they are uh, listed here um, by basically keywords. I'd like to mention measure adopted by three countries that we're not going to mention uh, in the panel. Ecuador has adopted technical specifications for procurement uh, by the Ministry of Health that in practice have a normative character. San Lucia has used social media and other forms of communication to reach a broad audience and promote use of validated devices, in addition to uh, adopting regulatory measures. Brazil does include uh, clinical validation in its marketing approval regulation, but still face challenges, as we'll see next. And the other examples I'll leave uh, for the panelists uh, that will um, describe uh, challenges as well. Thank you very much. Thank you, Cynthia, for illustrating what we've been doing. And maybe the word that has been prominent is challenges. Yes, but of course, 
uh, even if we have many challenges, we cannot ignore those and we need to uh, uh, confront them. The policies for ENT uh, for non communicable diseases, uh, we need to have more awareness. And now more people are aware of this, but what if we have more awareness, more people wanting to get their blood pressure measured, but they don't have accurate devices. So now I'm going to go over to our panelists for the second session. Stephanie Sikeda, who's a assistant um, professor uh, of uh, School of Nursing, State University of Campinas. I would request her to open her mic and turn on her uh, camera. And then we have Dr. Daniel Mola, a technical officer uh, from the Program of Control of Non-Communicable Diseases in Ministry of Public Health, uh, Dominican Republic. Then we have Yamile Valdez, who is a um, uh, doctor, head of the research department, University Hospital General Calixto Garcia in Havana, Cuba, and then Paula Silva Mendoza, advisor from the Department of Non-Communicable Diseases, Ministry of Health, Santiago de Chile. Well, you know, the scientists are giving you many uh, challenges and they say, well, this is hard, this is hard, this is difficult. So. We are going to begin with Stephanie Cicado, and I would like to ask you, I know you have done a study and I know you are the leader of uh, uh, online sales of 120 devices. And uh, you looked at 120 devices being sold online, 120, devices sold online and you checked whether those devices were validated or not. Uh, Stephanie, what did you find? Oh, we may now be afraid, but please tell us, share with us. Good morning. I would like to thank for the invitation. This webinar uh, is a great honor to participate and share my study. In 2020, uh, we did a study, but however, it was published recently. We had about 664 advertisements for uh, a device that should be used at home. They were done out of those advertisements, 137 models of um, for BP measurement. However, only 16.7% of those devices had been uh, through a study to uh, validation. Uh, this result showed to us that the great amount of devices in the market have not been through a validation process. Even so, so many regulated agencies requires that the manufacturers prove that they have been through a validation process before commercialized. Even so, most of the devices that were uh, available online, their uh, precision is questionable. So most of the time, the consumer, the patients, or the professionals end up buying those devices. A device that precision is not proved. Well, thank you, Stephanie. I, I, hey, I am scared. 16% of all the devices, only 16% of the equipment or the devices were validated. Daniel, you in Dominican Republic, as we say in my country and yours, well, if, if this is the thunder that we are hearing, imagine what's coming list to, next. So, Daniel, those of us who work in policy making in Dominican Republic, what should we do to have access to clinically validated um, devices? Daniel, over to you. And again, thank you, Stephanie, for your words. Over to you, Daniel. 
Daniel, you're muted. Uh, hello, everyone, and thank you for this invitation. We need to take into account that purchasing uh, devices to measure blood pressure should be validated clinically. And so uh, the uh, laws and regulations of countries should be respected. And where there are no laws or regulations, uh, that we need to have those laws so that validated devices are available. Uh, thank you, Daniel. One of the great problems, Yamile, is that, in fact, we have so many challenges. Maybe we could find a different word, but challenge, challenge, challenge. So, Yamile, you have just uh, completed a study, and I think you are about to publish it, and you received support from Paho and from Canada, <clears throat> Dr. Jennifer has been supporting us with this. So what happened? Tell us what happened with this and uh, what's the next step after your study? Yes, good afternoon. Yes, in fact, this is what happened. Uh, since the year 2000, there was production of automated uh, blood pressure devices, but we couldn't do clinical studies, but we requested uh, technical support to PAHO, and it was through um, uh, efforts from the University of Alberta that some training was done. First, we created a group for doing clinical studies uh, and designate an independent academic institution that could carry out uh, this uh, test at the Institute of uh, Cardiovascular Surgery. And then we designed a clinical trial uh, and it was then registered with the clinical trials of Cuba. And this was difficult, but uh, the universal standard was prepared in 2016 and then in 2018 then it was enacted and so there was an amendment for the cuff the design needs to be from good uh, best uh, clinical practices so when we got together to do the design everything was new we had to review absolutely everything and the study was very very rigorous and i never imagined it would be so hard and we had the assistance from the uh, uh, our state center for um, control of medications and devices and other technologies so this has been a very strict study and so the nationally produced uh, device complied with ISO A81060 part 2. So uh, we are preparing the manuscript with the guidelines and so that we can comply with all the requirements for publication. We're waiting for the certification from our regulatory authority so that we can publish the results of this clinical trial. And then after that, we will be able to hopefully be included in a list of validated instruments. I'm telling them that the next study will be in December. So what we're trying to do is uh, the first study was in the general population. Now we need to evaluate other populations, including children. This is a device for um, people over 12. So we need to have one for general population, for children and for other populations. So we need to understand that there is a cycle. It, it, it repeats over time. And if I'm promoting to have regulation for the exclusive use of validated uh, devices, everybody has to comply with these requirements. And this forces me to educate the public uh, that everybody, doctors and patients, need 
validated devices, the experience has been satisfactory so far, but it was very rigorous. Thank you very much, Yamile. I hope people are not scared off by this, but they understand that they need to do it. Now, Chile, Paula, you first uh, became committed. That was the first thing, your commitment. And then Chile started to change their uh, purchase uh, or procurement policy from non-validated to validated devices. So uh, um, how many validated devices do you now have and how's the procurement uh, policy implemented? I want to say that since 2012, and in order to improve diagnosis of hypertension, we have uh, technical documents uh, prepared with recommendations for best measurement of blood pressure and the use of devices that can best measure blood pressure. Uh, as part of the HEART initiative, we've seen that it is important to improve the quality of blood pressure taking. In our country, we have several uh, audiovisual resources uh, describing the best and the correct way to measure blood pressure. And um, uh, everything is updated to the year 2021. And uh, we have a recent publication of the use and procurement of validated devices and including a list of those that are validated and with guidelines for purchasing them. This was distributed among the whole uh, healthcare system, uh, these measures. And we also did a study uh, and um, we saw that between 2018 and 2020, the purchases, it went from 15 to 75 percent in terms of buying uh, automated devices. And uh, the increase was um, great to 64 percent in 2020. So it was doubled. Uh, yes, you did double the purchase of automated validated devices and so this is the way in which the ministry of health saw their commitment to the end meaning that they went from something having uh, just being in paper to being enforced Okay, please, uh, I would request the panelists. There are many questions for you in the chat and maybe you could check them out. And um, I want to have another round of questions. A few, few questions, or actually I, I would expect to have a final message. Stephanie, sh should we continue to study what is going on in the online uh, market that sells all kinds of things, and no matter how they are a validator or not? Should we give up or should we continue? We identify advertisements, over 400 advertisements. The greatest focus were uh, in regards to marketing, in terms of how does the device works. So most of the manufacturers on the sites that were publishing it, we'll talk about how practical it was to use, about the design on the device, what kind of measurement the device would do. If you could transport the data to another device and also price. But in terms of validation, very few advertisements mention validation. Only 11% had any sort of information about validation, any sort of mention of uh, scientific societies. So only 71 advertisements had this kind of information. The vast majority of, um, of advertisements did not. 
16 advertisements said that the, the device was indeed validated. However, over 400 advertisements said that the device was validated, but we could not find register. We could not men find any sort of mentioned proving that was the device was indeed part of a study. So this was fake advertisements, fake news in the advertisement. So the, the consumer may be misled uh, to think that the device was uh, validated. We also did a, st a comparison between the price. So the validated pr pr prices may, uh, may not be the cheapest one. So the, the consumer ended up buying something that's not validated and the precision may be questionable and they buy it because it's cheaper. Yes, Stephanie, and this is just, I, I don't know, there's someone in the chat saying that the issue was a high price, but uh, as an institution, and it's someone, as an institution, I would rather buy a, a device that is functional. So if people knew this, then it's important. So a matter here is how do we continue to teach the people? And Daniel in Dominican Republic, we've had a little bit of everything because we've had up to uh, uh, even some resistance by doctors to use automated validated uh, devices. They we're used to the traditional aneroid device. So what could we do to continue to educate uh, health providers? I think it is important in meetings such as this one. I think the team from Dominican Republic who are listening in now, I think this will change. Yes, there has been some resistance because people think that uh, uh, the digital ones don't measure with precision, but this has changed. Uh, the equipment has been validated. They are more accurate. People didn't use it because they, they gave them higher pressures, but than when they use the traditional devices, but it, when they went over to uh, the, uh, the uh, electronic devices then they rounded it to the closest zero i mean so it is important to keep educating the doctors and everyone and why and explain why it is important to use and measure with the uh, digital devices and and we need to continue doing this Thank you, Yamile. I was telling Cynthia that one of the issues with the devices is that they need to be part of an ecosystem and, and not be isolated. If I do not have a hypertension program, if I don't have a protocol for diagnosis and treatment, which will facilitate follow-up of patients at primary health care level. This is not done in isolation. It, me it needs to be part of an ecosystem where there is concern and priority given to the problem of hypertension. So my question, Yamile, for you very concretely now is what are we going to do so that all primary health care uh, centers have validated automated blood pressure devices since hearts started they talk, they started talking about measurement blood pressure with um, digital devices uh, so uh, we already have 18000 um, of these uh, electronic devices but many times the problem was that they were not validated. I insisted on the quality of the process and that an external authority would would guarantee uh, that uh, this device was truly clinically validated. I have thousands of 
uh, health centers and we need to have these validated. I need to start planning for next year and for the years following what are the requirements, what are the industry requirements so that we can comply. And we are doing a real world study with uh, technical availability. So what are the challenges? What happens to the batteries? What is the um, way of doing annual verifications, etc.? So we are doing surveillance of the technology and see for the next few years how we can plan for this. Thank you very much, Paula. What is your expectation? You Will you continue with uh, a procurement uh, policy or matrix that will be part of the health system uh, and, and having uh, clinically validated electronic devices? Well, Pedro, through the review we did of all the purchases we'd done before through public markets, we then realized that we could um, give alerts to the different health centers that were not purchasing validated devices. We have also created awareness in the a purchase of validated devices. And uh, we constantly give webinars and other trainings. And our greatest challenge right now is we have a large uh, working group uh, made up of different agencies working with medical devices. And um, the idea is to prepare a proposal uh, for standards for these devices so that they can be marketed in our country. All right, thank you. I think it's been wonderful to have you all here. So the first panel we had the scientists, they tell us about the uh, research and they are the research gurus, but here we now have in this panel, the real life. How can we take those medical advances, the, those research advances, and how can we translate them into the practice and how important it is to have collaboration from those who uh, work in public services and how this is enforced and implemented. And now we have, but before we're going to have a short break here, um, but again, our third panel will be with our keynote speaker, Dr. James Sharman, who is a medical doctor and PhD professor of medical research, deputy director of Menzies Institute for Medical Research, University of Tasmania, Hobart, Australia. So we'll have a short break now and after that i will formally introduce dr sharman hi i'm dr mark jaffe i've spent 25 years treating patients for hypertension at kaiser permanente where we improved blood pressure control rates from 44 percent to 90 percent i want to share with you why it's so important to use an automated digital blood pressure monitor to increase control of high blood pressure, we need to make sure hypertension care happens where most patients get treatment, and that's in the primary care setting. To take blood pressure with a manual device, you need to do many things at once. Use your fingers to control the deflation rate, use your eyes to read a small dial or a mercury column, and use your ears to listen for the sound of blood passing through the artery. Doing this right <clears throat> takes a lot of training, and even experienced staff make mistakes. Now, an automated digital monitor does all the difficult stuff for you. It inflates to the proper pressure and it deflates at the right speed. It displays the numbers on an easy to read screen and it doesn't require any listening. As long as you get a monitor that's validated, you can be confident that it will be accurate. <clears throat> Since an automated device is simple to use, training is easier and faster. That means healthcare workers can pay more attention to things like positioning the patient. Specialists might use other ways to measure blood pressure, but for primary care, automated digital monitors are the way to go. Hypertension treatment programs have saved many lives already. 
and automated digital blood pressure monitors can help save millions more. Thank you, Professor Mark Jaffe, who always comes on one way or another in our webinars. He has brought to us a message, a, a message that is very important. But now I want to introduce Professor James Sherman. He's also guest editor in this issue of the Journal of Human Hypertension. It is a pleasure to leave you with Professor Sherman, please. Sir. Pedro, thank you so much. It's wonderful to see you. Um, can you see my slides and hear me? Perfect, perfect. Go ahead, please. Thank you so much. Um, look, it's wonderful to be with you and to hear all the progress uh, through the Americas. It's terrific. So I'm, I'm calling in from, from Tasmania. One very small um, uh, adjustment to the to the introduction is I'm not a medical doctor, I'm a scientist. So just bearing that in mind. Um, look, thank you for the request to talk on, on this topic. And look, for those of us involved in, in public health, you know, our main interest here on this topic is accurate blood pressure measurement for better patient outcomes, for better outcomes for the public health outcomes. I think in understanding the best way forward, we also need to know in some sense what we're up against, and that is the industry perspective and, and how they envisage the way forward. And a way to look at this is through these market analysis reports that project the, the sales of blood pressure devices into the future. And if we look at this very recent report, uh, looking at the trends to 2030, what you see is that there's an expectation of massive global growth in the market sales of blood pressure devices at an 11.5% compound annual growth rate. This is enormous. Part of this report also talks about prominent players in the field, and I've listed here, just a few of them of which you will be probably familiar with some of these companies who have very good reputations. And these are some of the number of unique blood pressure devices that have been sold by some of these companies. And it may be a surprise to see just how many unique devices have been sold. These are prominent players. We want every single one of these devices, 100% validation. But unfortunately, as of this week, just check, this is the percentage of the devices sold by these prominent world players that have actually been validated. Uh, we're getting up to about 60% for the, for the best case scenario, nowhere near where we want, which is 100%. Factors that have been um, projected to propel business growth, including include things like, as we know, an increasing global burden of, of hypertension, growing demand for blood pressure devices, hypertension societies recommending self-measurement of blood pressure at home, so people purchasing their own devices. And somewhat ironically, the, the, the global and government initiatives to raise awareness of hypertension and blood pressure, including named in this report, the May Measurement Month by the International Society of, of Hypertension. Gaining prop popularity of wearables, as we heard, this, this is a potential issue because virtually none of wearables have been validated. And there's huge and rising investment in products by manufacturers. So this is kind of the setting of the scene going forward and the way forward envisaged by industry, of course, is, is driven principally by sales and profit. But of course, there are excellent players in the market that want good quality devices as well, but not all of them. So in going forward, you know, what can we do uh, effectively um, to work against some of these issues at play. And um, there is some good news suggesting we can make an impact through high quality publication activity because in this um, analysis report of the market, a restraining factor on business growth was identified as the lack of this issue that we're talking about, the lack of validation leading to decreased adoption of devices among, among healthcare professionals and the general public. And they cited this work on 
the high prevalence of non-validated devices, similar to as we heard from Dr. Vigato, you know, very low prevalence of, of validated devices. So this is this is in, encouraging because it shows the industry market analysts are, are taking note, and we can continue to push this message with by publishing in in journal journals uh, in different languages, original research commentaries, reviews, and as we have in the special issue, position statement and call to action to raise awareness, to increase knowledge, which we've all spoken about here, here today, to increase the evidence base, to understand exactly what the state of play is, to, to, to promulgate education, advocacy, and exert pressure for, for change. So this underlies some of the rationale for this publication in the Journal of Human Hypertension, a special issue. And I want to uh, send out thanks to all the colleagues uh, named here that helped with this um, position, uh, policy statement and call to action uh, from the World Hypertension League, League on the urgency to regulate the validation of automated blood pressure devices. It's endorsed by multiple um, credible organisations internationally. And this is part of the the process moving forward um, to get endorsement, to in, in enhance credibility, to enhance the, the distribution of this messaging through international global networks of these, these partners. And then these partners themselves become you know, part of the change agents uh, for, the, for the cause. And so this policy statement is intended as a resource for, for people on this call, on this web, webinar, health professionals, the civil society, including regulatory agencies, ministries of health and healthcare organisations. And the primary recommendation is the global regulatory requirement for the mandatory independent clinical validation of these automated blood pressure devices according to an, an agreed universal standard, which we have, as we heard, and I need to sound out thanks. I'm not sure if George is still awake because it's well past midnight in Athens, but uh, George and colleagues in Europe have really led the world, world here to establish that standard. And so um, I'm not going to take you through an exhaustive list of, of the recommendations, but a high level, at a high level, these are the intended policy outcomes to build strong regulatory capacity and systems so that ultimately you can only access purchase and use validated blood pressure devices. And this access is equitable and affordable. And really creating a situation where you can only have the sole use of validated blood pressure measuring devices for routine clinical use in primary healthcare, right throughout the, the Americas and through using the In The Hearts initiative. So a key concept underlying the positive way forward is that that governments with a strategy for prevention and control of cardiovascular disease and non-communicable diseases, such as the Heart through the Hearts Initiative, will be able to efficiently coordinate the implementation of policies. And this strategy, as we've all already alluded to, um, is detailed in this in this publication as part of the special issue. Uh, this is led by Pedro and colleagues through through the Americas. And it details the exemplary activity from the Hearts Initiative. Now, um, this is a highly complex uh, process involving so many different players at national and, and global levels. But some of the key factors in moving forward that it's exemplified in the through through the Hearts Initiative and what we heard in this in this paper is strong collaboration. You know, with PAHO through the implementing Hearts countries and other key stakeholders uh, that, are, that, that have an interest in this, in this issue. Uh, planning, developing and sharing implementation strategies, increasing awareness, education, access to resources and training, uh, including as needed validation studies. And I was so delighted to hear from your Miller and the results in Cuba and that is, and all the work that's gone into that, it's, it's amazing. Also creating uh, opportunities, as we heard uh, from Cynthia through initiatives such as including blood pressure device acquisition within the PAHO Strategic Fund, incredibly important uh, initiative to leverage uh, pooled procurement. 
webinars, workshops, technical meetings, webinars such as the one that, that we're on right now um, to advise, inform all the key players involved in this, in this issue. Providing resources, education and training, easily accessible on web-based material for policymakers, health professionals, regulatory agencies. Here, um, you know, quick links, how to find automated blood pressure devices, enhancing education. Practical tools for governments here, and again, already mentioned by Cynthia, but really important also um, translated to Spanish, really important resources. Training, again, we alerted to this um, earlier on, uh, a, a virtual course on the accurate measurement of blood pressure with embedded information on how to access validated blood pressure devices. You heard from Pedro, a lot of people have been have accessed this. Indeed, more than 38,000 people have completed this. Uh, and that includes physicians, non-physician health, healthcare workers and others. So there's huge impact here. People are using these resources. So through so many initiatives um, uh, involving uh, people, programs, agency, agencies, education, training, and, and so many ways, Hearts in the Americas represents an exemplar leading the way forward and what we need to do. And it's little wonder that, that, that Hearts in the Americas received an award, an advocacy award in cardiovascular health for, for the work in recognition of, of going above and beyond in their quest to promote uh, global heart health. I want to I just finish with two very, um, I think, important gaps needed going forward, and that is, is dedicated funding and, and people, full-time equivalents, dedicated to this, this, this effort. We have this um, effort infused through um, the Hearts Initiative, but we don't have anything anywhere else like this around the world. So we can't access funding uh, opportunities to, to support the activities that need to occur. So I think this, this, this needs to, to happen. And I think we need to really amplify um, involvement with industry. We need um, credible companies uh, to understand the value proposition of providing, only providing validated devices and, and then themselves become leading agitators uh, towards change. And we heard uh, from Tammy in the first talk, uh, we had, this is why and, uh, we invited uh, industry for their perspectives as part of this special issue. So I want to send out thanks to these people listed here and look forward to working uh, and understanding more in working with industry. So there are a few few thoughts on the situation and the way forward. Thank you very much, uh, Pedro. Professor Sherman, como siempre, un placer. Professor Sherman, it's really a pleasure to have you here with this extraordinary participation. Let me tell you the following. We only have a few minutes left before we conclude and I'm going to ask you to stay with us because we're going to take the picture. People always look for that family picture. So that's what we are going to do at the very end today. And thank you all for the participation. But we have a very, very brief segment. We are awarding a prize to the champions in the Americas, the World Hypertension League is recognizing the America's champions. So we are going to have a one minute break so that the our Ds can prepare themselves. And also Marcelo Bodia, who is the vice president of the World Hypertension League. Brief break. Saint Lucia is a savior. Oh, as usual, after this hour and a half, 
hour and a half, a whole past. We have 500 participants and we only have a maximum of 500 individuals. That's why we said we are going to give a certificate for all those who participated today. So I'm going to give the floor to Dr. Marcelo Villa, who is the vice president of the World Hypertension League. He is at Yale and he's one of our consultants with heart. Marcelo, please go ahead. What do you, what do you have to share with us? And as you call them, please ask them to turn on the camera. We are going to have here the next round. Well, good afternoon to all of you. And thank you, Pedro, for this invitation to such an important event. Every year, the World Hypertension League prizes those individuals who have awards prizes to those individuals who have been champions of this fight against hypertension. And this year, three prizes have been awarded to entities and individuals related with the hearts in the Americas program. It, we are very happy about that. The first prize is for an individual who is my mentor in many areas, and therefore it is a great pleasure for me to award the Dettler Candle Excellence Award in the Implementation of Global Health to Dr. Don DePerry. Dr. DePerry is a distinguished professor in health sciences in South Carolina, the US, and he's also a consultant with the Hearts in the Americas Initiative. Don, congratulations. Well, it's an honor to receive the GAN Excellence Award in Hypertension and Global Health Implementation this year from the World uh, Hypertension League. I deeply thank uh, Dr. Ores, members of the awards committee and the World Hypertension League leadership, and more importantly, the family. This award is particularly special to me. I've, I've given this some thought because it's an honor. It's in honor of the contributions that Dr. Ganton has made. Uh, during my fellowship in hypertension and my training at Boston University when I was a lot younger, Dr. Gan and his work were introduced to me by my mentors. Drs. Harry Gavras and Drs. Aaron Trebanian. Dr. Gann is a giant in building the foundation of our understanding of the pathophysiology and more importantly, the clinical significance of hypertension and its treatment. And thus I am, I am truly honored uh, to have the award under his name. Also though, and importantly, I believe that this award is directly related to my participation in the PAHO led Hearts in the Americas uh, initiative or program, as well as the WHO. Uh, Global Hearts uh, Initiative, and as such, it's been a distinct pleasure to be part of the Hearts team. And more importantly, and I think most importantly, while this award is an individual award, by extension, it is also an award to the Hearts team, especially the work of PAHO. It extends the awards that PAHO has already won and, and received as an institution for the amazing, amazing progress of detecting, managing, and controlling hypertension in Latin America and the Caribbean. So really, finally, thank you, thank you, thank you again. I look forward to be part of the, the team and contributing in some way with, with the journey forward. Uh, it's, uh, it, we've come a long way, but there's an awful long way to go. And I know, I know we can do it, and I'm just thrilled to be part. And this award uh, is special to me. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Arias. Thank you, Don. What well, very well deserved. Eh, los premios de la World Hypertension League organizadas. The World Hypertension League only grants two prizes all over the world, and this year we have the distinctive honor to have both prizes awarded to organizations related to hearts in the Americas. So the first prize, that is for population hypertension control goes to the Heart Initiative of Ecuador with the Ministry of Health. Dr. Jose Ruales will be accepting the prize as Vice Minister of Health Governance in Ecuador. Good afternoon. Thank you very much to Dr. Marcelo Orias and also to the World Hypertension League for this recognition. On behalf of the Ministry of Health of Ecuador and the Minister Jimena Garzón, and in particular, on behalf of all of the health staff, doctors, nurses, and from the community hospital who are working on the Heart Initiative and who have promoted the initiative 
the topic of hypertension nationally. And I am here to accept the prize. Ecuador is deeply committed with the initiative, with the problem that we see in the country right now. We have been adopting the clinical practice guidelines issued by WHO. We are also adapting the initiative for the application at the local level, and we are extending the initiative universally to all of our health centers throughout the country. We are especially making progress with the support of PAHO, Dr. Duñez, and also all of the local team with the training for the development of the tools for using those of pharmacological nature, but also emphasizing the non-pharmacological ones to promote health styles, food, and also work with the communities, with our population, risk population, etc. So we are very proud to receive this prize on behalf once again of all of the health workers with the ministry, in particular those who are leading this initiative. Thank you. Congratulations, Vice Minister. Please continue the good work. Keep it up. And the final award this afternoon is dietary salt reduction at the population. Dietary salt reduction at the at the population level. This is um, a program with the Ministry of Health from Argentina to be accepted by Nicholas Harbour, who is the director of comprehensive treatment of non-transmissible, non-communicable diseases with the Ministry of Health of Argentina. Hi, Marcelo. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon from Argentina. I see several colleagues that are connected from different areas of the country. Thank you, Pedro. The event was very interesting, engaging to hear, to listen to the various problems that the countries have. This is also encouraging. This also allows us to think about this as a even a health problem, because this is a health problem for everyone, to see how we can make progress, share experiences. And in Argentina, I am the one receiving it today, but the truth is that on behalf of Dr. Carla Visotti, we're all convinced, and we think that this is the way to make progress for cooperation, and I also, send my greetings to Sebastián Aspur as the representative of Argentina before PAJO, and um, especially in, in the area of non-communicable diseases. And because of this prize, Argentina is a pioneer in this type of action, since we do have a law on the reduction of sodium, and we are willing to share with whoever would like to know about this, to share more information, to cooperate, to share with you how we have been working with the various sectors. This is a cross-cutting job. We do it from the point of view of the public sector, the civil society, and we work with different levels within the ministry that also work with us on passing this law, and this has been a success. Together with that, and also as a con continuation of the policy, we are working with HEART, we are relaunching it with various pilots nationally. So once again, Marcelo, thank you. And I also want to congratulate Dr. Valles from Ecuador who received this prize and greetings to all. Thank you. On behalf of the Ministry of Health of Argentina, Dr. Carla Visotti, we are happy to be here with you and also in the upcoming commissions and committees that we might be working on. Congratulations. Marcelo, thank you very much to you and the awardees. How about if all of the panel members and those who were receiving the prizes today turn on their cameras, as well as all of those who participated in the production of the event, 
we take a final picture. I am so sorry for those who got up so early. Alta Jane, I am so sorry you had to get up so early. George, who is in Greece, I imagine that it is midnight there. So again, really moving to have done here, you know that we really like you. We really like you. We are such a popular figure here in the region. People adore you. So what a beautiful example you set for the region. Everyone says well-deserved. So we are so proud of you, so proud of you being with us. James, incredible, tremendous work, Rallis. We hope you are an inspiration and we hope we, we, other countries in the Americas continue to do what Ecuador is doing with Argentina. We hope you are now engaged, fully engaged with you, Nicolas, and we are anxious for Argentina to roll up their sleeves to work hard on this issue. So congratulations to all of you. There's always someone taking the picture. I don't know how many screens we have. We have several. We had full room, 500 participants for two hours. I don't know how we did it, but it seems it is very interesting. So to all of you, we are interpreting into three languages. We always want to provide interpretation into all the languages so that everyone is engage and wants to participate such a beautiful effort and congratulations to all thank you all thank you thank you thank you and uh, we will conclude now with a video from ecuador that is to celebrate today's champion that is ecuador congratulations congratulations to the whole team from ecuador for the tremendous work carried out thank you see you later have a beautiful day whatever it is, beautiful evening, and we see it next time. So please go ahead. Thank you all. Thank you all. So the, we had a patient who was about to become diabetic and had the hypertension. We estimate that 25.8% of the population between 18 and 69 years of age in Ecuador have three or more risk factors for the development of non-communicable health diseases such as heart disease. 20 out of 100 Ecuadorians older than 18 have hypertension. Some of the main factors for complication and early death include hypertension that account for 25% of mortality in the country. So we help with uh, consultations to change the diet and also lifestyle. My lifestyle is now more healthy. I have been able to lose weight. I have been able to overcome hypertension. My, my, my heart is in proper form. So heart is intended to reduce the incidence of hypertension and also avoiding diseases that can be prevented through better nutrition, early, early identification, pharma, pharmaceutical and non-pharmaceutical treatment, as well as follow up from the first level of care. The recommendations I received from the staff have been very good. As a matter of fact, the follow up way that my blood pressure has been excellent and this has also provided me help to manage the disease. This initiative is implemented in 403 health centers nationally. In 2025, it will be in 100% of these facilities of first level of care. 3,500 3, centers are participating in this initiative and 22 countries that are working on this have been, have included Ecuador that has been awarded the prize by the World Health Hypertension Prevention. So I would like to uh, uh, give a round of applause for all these awardees and uh, congratulate them for their many achievements. This recognition is the outcome of the commitment and the work of our own government through the technical teams in the Ministry of Public Health. We reach a new milestone and a new world 
achievement. Together we can. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for your support. Rale, un abrazo. Un abrazo, Rale. Rale, big hack to you. El apoyo, el continuo apoyo que se está dando. Y... We thank you, Pedro, for the ongoing support. We thank everyone. This is from Ecuador. We thank everyone from the Ministry of Health with their commitment. Have a good afternoon, and we hope to continue to see each other in these very important events.